They have the ability to amend the policy. They have the ability to make recommendations to the Commission. Anything that is decided upon by the Council of Ministers still requires ratification by the European Parliament as a whole before passing into European law. It can then be challenged. Oh, I've forgotten one, which I should put in here. Sorry. First two are easy. What's the third letter? ECJ. European Court of Justice. Court of Justice. Okay. That's my mistake, because the European Court of Human Rights usually decides issues relating to the Charter on Human Rights. It is the European Court of Justice, the ECJ, which sits in Brussels, which decides on trade disputes between member states, breaches of European directives and things like that. So the process would be that the Council of Ministers or the Commission would formulate, develop the policy, it's debated in Parliament, it's essentially ratified in Parliament, but it's passed by the Commission into law. The European Court of Justice is where disputes are arbitrated. Okay? So the Council of Ministers does have some democratic legitimacy to it. But there is a question still as to whether citizens of the European Union, when deciding upon national elections, properly consider those parties' positions on European issues. Because we may well want a government that is different at home to one that is deciding European matters. But we don't necessarily get that choice. And because of the way the Council of Ministers is formed. The European Commission, on the other hand, is made up of who? Every, uh, every state. There's usually two per state. So the governments of each member state get to make recommendations for who their European Commissioner will be, or Commissioners will be. It's usually, but not always, a former politician of the National Assembly. Somebody who has been in some form of legislative body before. But there is no guarantee that that is the case. Currently, for the UK, Peter Mandelson is one of the European Commissioners. Uh, the head of the European Commission wields an awful lot of power. Okay? The head of the European Commission wields an awful lot of power. The Commission is not elected in any sense. Appointments to the Commission are approved by the Parliament and by the Council of Ministers, but only in exceptional circumstances are countries required to deselect a candidate and put forward another one. Okay? Generally speaking, the people chosen by the Member States are accepted as European Commissioners. But it is the Commission that is responsible for the formulation and implementation of the vast majority of European law. Okay? And in the areas of competence, European law is supreme. That means it overrides domestic law. That what the European Commission decides as law, upheld by the European Court of Justice, must in some way be implemented in the Member States. There are mechanisms within the European Treaty, it used to be Article 27 and 28, it's probably changed since the introduction of the last treaty, that were the mechanisms for enforcement of directives. Okay, fines and things like that. Okay, so that's briefly the structure in terms of the individual institutions. At the top sits the European Commission, in terms of they have the most power, they have the clearest mandate to investigate, formulate policy as a response, and implement. It is also they who decide whether to take the course to the European Court of Rights in terms of breach of duty, in terms of fulfilling a directive or a recommendation. I'll talk about the difference between directives and recommendations in just a second. Alongside, but slightly below the European Commission, we would then have the Council of Ministers. Independent of the Commission, comprised of directly elected officials in their member states, but who may not have been elected 
for the purposes of European affairs. They get together in the areas of competence, so business secretaries, finance secretaries, depending on what it is, to discuss potential policy. Policies of both pass through the European Parliament for debate. The Parliament, as I said, can only recommend alterations or raise potential objections. We think this policy is problematic because in country X certain things will happen. Or in country Y we won't be able to implement this because. And that is where the elected members from each member state get to make the case for their country. The odd thing is that within the European Parliament we very rarely see countries acting in unity. Okay? So what we see is the formation of three main blocks. The Conservative, the Moderate, and the Liberal. And just as in national assemblies and national legislatures, I'll get my words out in a minute, Major parties tend to fall into one of those three groups, so they do in European elections as well. What is different is in European elections, the Conservative, the right-wing parties of Germany, France, Slovenia, Britain, tend to group together in a Conservative voting bloc. Okay? This leads to the anomaly that the Conservative group in the European Union are the most vocal about ending the European Union or reducing its powers, reducing its influence over member states. That is the group in which the anti-Europe candidates or MEPs find themselves. And it, oddly we do elect some who are explicitly anti-Europe. Okay? Britain has sent members of the UKIP party to Brussels, United Kingdom Independence Party, also known as Sending the Clowns. In Hungary, a member of Jobbik has been elected to the member of the European Parliament. Their explicit stated aim is to remove Hungary from the European Union, as with UKIP. But the Conservative coalition within the European Union is quite broad. It also covers more moderate Conservatives, like German Christian Democrats, for example. Okay, the moderates in Europe, as their name suggests, are pretty squarely in the middle. They like to sit on the fence a little bit. They're not anti-Europe, but they recognise that people at home might be, so they try and straddle both fields. That's groups like Social Democrats in Germany, um, Holland as well. It's not a particularly large group. Then there are the Liberal group, who are very, very progressive and see the European project as a way of helping progressive policies be formulated in countries which might otherwise not have them. So countries like Hungary, where some of the policies at the moment seem a little regressive, it's the Liberals who are pushing the influence of the European Union to change that. That would include parties like the Green parties of most member states, uh, in the Netherlands, D66, Deces and Sestif, is the ultra-liberal party, and there are others dotted around the European Union. Very rarely will you find all MEPs from one country voting the same way on an issue in the European Parliament, because their vote is dictated by their membership of a particular coalition or bloc. Equally, their vote will be dictated by their view of the European project as a whole, whether they are broadly pro or anti European. The position of the Conservatives is that countries have given away too much of their independence to Europe, that they are no longer in control of their own destinies with regards to immigration or economy, that the Euro has taken away their ability to run their own affairs properly, and we might see an example of this in which country? Which country doesn't have control over its own economy at the moment? Greece. Who has control over Greece's economy? Germany. Germany. Because Germany is by far the biggest financial player in the Eurozone. This is part of the reason why all the anti-European people in Britain are looking rather smug at the moment, because they think that this was always going to happen in the Eurozone. That you can't simply marry economies which are so diverse. 
that ignores the fact that it seems to manage quite well in the United States, where equally the economies of individual states are incredibly diverse. But they have mechanisms within the federal bank that correct for that. So the fact that California has 10 times the population of, let's say, Arkansas, and almost 100 times the wealth, doesn't affect the economies of either that they have the same currency. In pure economic theory, the currency you have is just a token. It doesn't really reflect anything. Okay? But then you would need to put barriers in place to stop people moving money from one jurisdiction to another to take unfair advantage of interest rates and things like that. What is odd about the finances of the European Union is that whilst there are specific criteria for entry into the euro, you have to have inflation at a certain level, growth has to be predicted at a certain level, and so on. If you fall below those levels once you have the euro, we don't take it off you. So you can't have the euro until your economy works like this, but if your economy no longer works like this, you can still have the euro. That might be damaging for the currency as well. So there are other reasons why the Eurozone is problematic that aren't simply linked to it just being a single currency. However, in the popular mindset, having your own currency, and this is certainly true in Britain, where the UKIP symbol, political symbol, is this. It started as a save the pound campaign. Okay? And still on their badges, you will see that pound symbol. That is their raison d'etre. I, I know they hate me using a French term to describe them, that's why I do it. Their reason for being is to maintain UK fiscal independence, particularly. And Britain has a special relationship, of course. I say special in the sense of abusive with the European Union. We take the bits we like, we ignore the bits we don't, and we kick up a fuss whenever we're asked to contribute to anything else. The French have a slightly different relationship to Europe. They implement the policies they agree with, they ignore the policies they don't, and they refuse to pay any fines. It is often up to national government how they implement policy formulated by either the Commission or the Council of Ministers. There are two types of policy within the European Union. There are directives, and recommendations. Recommendations, as their name suggests, are not binding. They are just recommendations. The European Parliament has the ability to make recommendations. It is then left entirely to the national governments of member states as to whether they ever implement that recommendation. Okay? There was a recommendation from the European Parliament that minimum wages should be increased to the level of a living wage. That is somewhere around 50 to 60 percent of the median wage of the country. That is not something for which the European Union has competence at the moment, and therefore cannot pass a directive, a legally binding policy. But it was a recommendation made. Certain countries were already doing it, which was the basis on which the recommendation was made. Some countries said, we will do this. Some countries said, we think this is a bad idea. And the European Commission and Parliament said, yeah, it's up to you. You can probably guess which countries have a minimum wage that approaches a living wage without me telling you. Where would you think would have that kind of policy? Netherlands. Netherlands? Mm. Pardon? Scandinavia. Scandinavia and Finland. Those are always the ones. Okay? Scandinavian democracy has always been much more of a social democracy than a conservative democracy. That is, wealth distribution mechanisms are fairer in a socialist sense that income gaps are reduced, that the idea of civic duty is more ingrained into the society, perhaps. This is, a, this is very, very true of Finland. Finland, still almost unique amongst European countries now, has free university education for all its citizens to master's level. 
okay? You do not pay a cent for your education until you have completed your master's degree. There are often grants and bursaries available for people who couldn't live whilst they were studying. What that means is that approaching 60% of the Finnish population have advanced degrees. They are an incredibly technocratic society. But their GDP is dominated by one company. Nokia. Represents 80% of the Finnish gross domestic product. If Nokia loses the smartphone battle, Finland collapses. So the Finnish government has a vested interest in producing lots of people with lots of advanced degrees in things like computer engineering and things like that to keep Nokia's competitive advantage in that sense. Nokia actually started out as a wood pulping firm. And they then moved into galvanised rubber, they made Wellington boots for a while. In Finland, you can buy a Nokia fridge, a Nokia television. Your whole house can be kitted out with Nokia gadgets. It's brilliant. Okay? But Finland, Scandinavia, generally, and the Netherlands as well, have a concept of social democracy which demands that things like minimum wages tend to be higher, social welfare payments tend to be higher. Um, the social welfare payments in the UK are pitifully small. Currently, if you're over 25 and unemployed, the maximum you can receive from the state is £71 a week. Okay? £71 a week as income support. That is to pay for all your travel, all your food, all your expenses like your heating bills, your telephone and things like that. £71 is about €80. Euros. It's not a huge amount to live on every week. Okay? By contrast, in the Netherlands, Social welfare payments, to, just for your income support, this is separate to any housing benefit you might receive, usually around 180 to 200 pounds a week. A living wage, if you will. What they do do in the Netherlands is they place far more duty on the individual claiming the benefit to prove that they are actively looking for work. And they will stop your benefit if you're not. So they justify the higher payments by making higher demands on the job seeker. It seems to work, but whether the Netherlands is going to find it sustainable through the economic crisis where tax revenue is decreasing rather than increasing, it's not sure. But those are recommendations. They are things which the European Union, through the Parliament or through the Commission or the Council of Ministers, thinks it would be good for states to do, but recognises it has no specific mandate to demand. So we'll leave recommendations there and we'll look at directives. There are two types of directive. This is where the language of the European gets really fun, why student lawyers hate the European law. There are directly effective directives. And can you guess what the other type are? Yeah. Indirectly effective directives. Yeah. You've got to be a bit of a tongue twister to in order to talk about European structures. Indirectly effective directives. Okay, put very, very simply, and this might be a little less nuanced than reality, but it's sufficient for the purposes of this class and for your knowledge for debate. A directly effective directive is a policy which, when passed by the Commission, must be implemented, usually by a date given by the Commission, and in the form mandated by the Commission. Okay? It is a directly effective directive is a policy or piece of legislation, usually passed by the Commission, but once it's been ratified by, by the Parliament, that must be implemented, usually by a certain date, and in the form required by the Commission. So they specify exactly how member states have to implement a certain policy. Okay? So, for example, and we'll ignore the fact that Britain opted out of this, when European citizenship became real, the idea of checking people's passports at borders seemed anathemic to that. It seemed impossible to have a total free movement of peoples in a supranational state if you still had border controls. Okay? 
The European Union said, and it was a directly effective directive, that on a certain date, all border controls for other members of the European Union must cease. Britain remained a special case because Britain had refused to sign an earlier visa known as the Schengen Area Accord. Okay, earlier treaty known as the Schengen Area Accord. The Schengen Area Accord is not a European Union piece of legislation. There are members of Schengen who are not in the European Union, and there are members of the European Union who are not members of Schengen. Us, for example. Which is why when we book a flight to Slovenia, we have to put in passport details on our flight booking, but people within the Schengen area don't. Okay? But that was a directly effective directive. We were told, or the member states were told, you must simply stop. From this date, there will be free movement of peoples within this area. An indirectly effective directive is one where the broad aim of the policy needs to be achieved, but it is left to the individual member states exactly how they go about achieving it. A good example of this brings us back to the link between the European Union and the Council of Europe. In 1999, the European Union itself became a signatory to the European Charter on Human Rights. Oh, sorry, 1990, no, 1997. The treaty that was produced in 1997 made the European Union and de facto all its members a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights. Now remember that the Convention as a charter is a piece of uh, legislation from the Council of Europe, that is those 45 countries, nothing to do with the European Union. But once the European Union itself became a signatory to the charter, it said that by 1999 at the latest, all member states must have passed the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic law in some form. Okay? So every state was required to pass a subsequent piece of legislation in their own National Assembly that mirrored the European Convention. So that it wasn't simply an issue for the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg to administrate, but domestic courts could adjudicate and uh, decide on disputes before it went to the European Court of Human Rights. In Britain this was done in 1998 through something called the Human Rights Act. So the Human Rights Act is Britain's way of implementing an indirectly effective directive from the European Union. What it meant was that individual member states could choose to pass the entire charter into law or could choose certain parts of the Charter because the overall aim was to ensure that there was some human rights protection in domestic law. They weren't required to pick the parts of the Charter that the European Commission told them to. They were given an option to opt out of certain clauses. Britain did. The Human Rights Act and the European Charter on Human Rights are not the same document. There are omissions in the Human Rights Act because our National Assembly decided that it wasn't right for the country at the time. But the broad aim of the policy was still fulfilled. Okay? So those are two examples of how directives can be directly effective, that is they must be passed into law in exactly the form as mandated, or indirectly effective, which is the aim or purpose of the directive must be fulfilled. Okay. What do we do when people don't implement directives? As I said, the article numbers, I think, for these have probably changed. They used to be known as Article 27 and Article 28. But I will double check for you and I will confirm. Article 27 and Article 28 of the old EU treaty talked about potential sanctions for non-compliance. Now, most of the directives that have been passed by the European Union have been indirectly effective. That is, member states are given a degree of latitude as to how those policies are properly implemented. However, there are sanctions for non-compliance. Article 27 deals with sanctions for
for directly effective directives, Article 28 deals with sanctions for the indirectly effective directives. They are both sanctioned usually by fines. The European Commission fines the member state for non-compliance. Unfortunately, and there is an article on this in um, an old issue of the European Law Review from 2004, because I wrote it, there is no collection mechanism in Article 27 or 28, so we can pass fines, we just have no way of actually getting that money. So it's like saying to somebody, you've done a really bad thing, I'm going to sentence you to prison, but not actually having a prison. You're passing the judgment, but you're not enforcing the judgment at all. Okay? And my contention in 2004 was that this lack of a collection mechanism, lack of enforcement, meant that the law itself probably wasn't valid, from a legal theorist's point of view. If you cannot enforce the laws you pass, then the laws you pass are no more than tokenism, particularly when it comes to sanctions. The countries most commonly sanctioned by the European Union for non-compliance, France and Italy, they both currently owe the Commission billions of euros in fines. There is something in Europe known as the CAP. Does anybody know what it stands for? One of the first pieces of European legislation, back when we were simply the European Economic Area Agreement, before we were even the European Economic Community. Okay? It is the common, yeah, common agricultural policy. It is the system by which the European Union subsidises farming in the Union. It is the reason why Britain did not join the European Economic Area Agreement until as late as 1973 because France wouldn't let us. Because the common agricultural policy was still being written, there are lots of large farms in France, and the French leaders decided that they wanted a common agricultural policy that favoured French farmers. Understandably, that is their mandate, to protect their national interests. So de Gaulle, who was president of France during the 50s and 60s, when the European uh, economic Area Agreement was first formed by the Treaty of Rome, 1957, blocked Britain's application to enter until such time as the common agricultural policy was giving plenty of subsidy to French farmers and couldn't be altered. That's just not just me being, just being anti-French, that's agreed sort of common idea within European history. What I said in 2004 was, that the countries that receive the largest subsidies under the common agricultural policy are the countries who currently owe the Commission the most money for non-compliance of directives. Can anybody see what my solution might be? Yeah, link next year's subsidy to the unpaid fines. Un unpaid fines? Unpaid fines even. Okay? Withhold subsidy payment until that fine is paid. Simple, right? Effective. Joined up government. It's never going to happen because there are too many vested interests. Everybody I know who is a legal theorist in the European Union goes, yeah, it's a pretty sensible idea, pretty standard, would be simple to administrate, would definitely be effective. Because if one thing scares the French government more than anything, it's angry French farmers. And that's how you get the French government to comply with European directives, is you make their farmers angry. You take away their subsidy, they go and protest and burn sheep in the streets, or whatever it is they do. Then the French government starts to comply. Same with any government. Believe me, I'm not anti-French. I love the French. I'm a Francophile. I want to live in France. I think it's one of the best countries in the European Union. But I think it's shocking that in any union, one individual member state gets to what so flagrantly bend and break the rules for its own ends. I understand the desire. I understand the argument that protecting the national interest is what all the national governments should be doing. 
But as I've said, the French government are very, very good at implementing the policies they like and just ignoring the ones they don't. Because they know there is no collection mechanism for Article 27 or Article 28 fines. Okay? Contrast that with what Britain does. Now, Britain is much less pro European as a state than France is. France generally is quite pro the European project. Britain generally is quite anti the European project. Might be a product of our island mentality, we might just be a little bit racist, who knows? We might just not like foreigners. I mean, we've had lots of wars with Europe, why should we now want to be friends with them? I think that's the attitude of most people in Britain. What the British government does is quite interesting. Whenever a directive is passed, and remember these are usually indirectly effective, that is the British government gets to choose how to implement the policy, the British government chooses the most draconian way possible. Usually the way that harms people rather than helps them. Why would it do that? Exactly. Then when people complain, the British government go, there's nothing we can do. The European Union made us do it. They're the bad guys. It wasn't me, miss. The bullies made me do it. Right? So popular support for the European Union decreases further. So when the Prime Minister David Cameron goes to Brussels and says, we want our powers back, everybody in Britain goes, yes, we really want those powers back. We forget that the British government chooses how to implement these policies. They choose to implement these policies in a way which damages us, makes the policy look bad, and then they say, not my fault. If you use a great French phrase, you sleep on you. Hold their hands up. Now that is one way to undermine support for the European Union as a whole. Couple that with the idea that there is democratic deficit within the European Union, and it's very easy to see why most people in Britain, when asked if they want to be in or out of Europe, say out. It's a very easy rhetoric. It's one that permeates, particularly, popular media in exceeding states. You, particularly in Croatia, were told that joining the European Union would be really bad for you. Bad for your independence, particularly. The independence you fought for 800 years today. And it's gone at the stroke of a pen. It hasn't. Don't believe the hype. Your government has the power either to not implement the policy, like France, and just ignore the fine, or to implement it in a way that is good for you rather than bad for you. Hold them to account before blaming the supranational structure. Okay? That's important for all citizens of the European Union when we come to consider what it means to be enfranchised. Okay, enfranchisement on a European level is almost unequivocally a good thing. It doesn't just mean lovely visa-free travel to Slovenia and cheap phone calls home. Because all the mobile providers give you a discounted rate if you're in the EU rather than outside the EU. Enfranchisement is important because it's very often a protection against the worst excesses of your national government. The European Union, your citizenship of the European Union, confers upon you specific rights which your national government must then uphold. The whole idea of human rights was a European project that we forced member states to incorporate into domestic law. The fact that those rights are respected by domestic governments is because of the European Union. Okay? Not because governments are nice fluffy bunnies that like a cuddle. Governments are not. Governments are not to be trusted unless you can hold them to account. That's been proven time and time again by corruption scandals, by governments being in bed with big business, ignoring the will or even what is right for their people at the sake of making profit. Okay? That is why big corporations get away with paying little tax and things like that. Enfranchisement might be even more important for those people who find themselves stateless or unable to remain in their home country for whatever reason. Political dissidents, for example. 
We have better dissent and therefore better democracy in the European Union because if my country tries to persecute me, I have every right to go and live in France as a citizen of Europe. Or every right to go and live in Germany as a citizen of Europe. Or Spain, I might choose Barcelona because the football is better. Okay? There is one group of people who are not yet enfranchised within the European Union because they are entirely stateless. It may well be that the European Union is the only way in which we can provide these people with rights, the rights to which they are already entitled but they are not accorded by virtue of their statelessness. And it is almost certainly the only way we can protect these people from persecution within member states. Who am I talking about? Roma. France saw fit to deport people who were born in France simply because of a different ethnicity. I think that's abhorrent, ladies and gentlemen. I think that is a policy we haven't seen in Europe since the 1940s. I don't think anybody should be targeted on the virtue of their ethnicity or their religion. There is, however, a possible solution. The Commission, the Parliament, could grant Roma supranational citizenship. which would prevent countries like France from deporting them. Because they would have the rights protected just as every other citizen of the European Union does. I think it's something that the European Union needs to do. I think it's something that they need to do quickly, particularly given the terrible situation of most Roma people in places like Hungary, for example, where they are targeted with violence, with discrimination, where the party Jobbik explicitly refers to them as a virus on the Hungarian or in the Hungarian state. Any time that people start being described as a disease, we should all be very, very worried. Okay? Because we don't know when the next group to be targeted is us. Remember the quotation from Germany. When they came for the communists, I did not speak up because I was not a communist. When they came to the homosexuals, I did not speak up, so I was not a homosexual. When they came to the Jews, I did not speak up, I was not a Jew. When they came for me, there was nobody left to speak up. We need to do something. We need to do it now. We need to enfranchise those people who still don't have the protections that the European Union gives us. It is unwieldy. It is a complex structure. We've added layer upon layer much in the manner of a blind architect on LSD. We don't really know where one bit sits on another and it juts out a little bit over here and it looks a little bit ugly over here. But at the end of the day, we make it work. It works very, very well for the provision and protection of rights particularly. It works incredibly well to improve, increase and harmonise trade across an incredibly large and diverse area. We have all benefited from the removal of trade barriers within the European Union. Many countries, although the individuals don't always feel it right now, have benefited economically from the introduction of the Euro. It would be senseless to throw away the whole project just because there were bits of it that we didn't think were working properly. But our duty as citizens of this superstate is to make those bits work make them work for us. We can do that best and first by holding our own governments to account, making them live up to their responsibilities, rejecting governments like the British government, which choose bad ways of implementing policy and then claim the policy is bad. We should find ways of tightening up loopholes so that governments like France and Italy can't shirk their responsibilities to pay their fines or implement the directives as they're supposed to do. It's not a pick and mix stand in the market where you have a bit of this European Union and some of that European Union. You take the whole bag or you don't take it at all. I'm fine with member states leaving if they want. I'm not okay with member states deciding when they're a member and when they're not. I think that's damaging to the institution of the Union. I think ultimately it's damaging for us as citizens. And if anything, we are all better off 
because of the world we live in being a united Europe than the world my parents grew up in when Europe was ripped apart twice in 20 years. If the European Union has done anything, it's meant we haven't fought each other since 1945, for the most part. Okay? Let's keep that trend going. Let's do what we can to fix it, but let's not throw it on the scrappy. Are there any questions? Yeah, um, so, unfortunately for me, you were uh, making fun of UK IP. I, I kind of agree with them. <laughs> so, um, I, I think that, do you think that the Britain should have the Euro and the Schengen border? I think Britain needs to decide whether it's part of Europe or not. I don't think it gets to say we're part of Europe when we want to be, but not when we don't. I think had Britain joined the Euro when it was introduced, the Euro might be stronger than it is now. I don't necessarily think keeping the pound has benefited us that much, given the fluctuation in the value of the Euro since its introduction compared to now. The Euro is worth almost double what it was when it was introduced. Okay? When the continent converted to the Euro, I could happily get two and a half Euros for my pound. Now I'm lucky if I get 1.1. So the euro has almost reached parity with the pound at a time when I'm told the eurozone is in crisis. Currencies in crisis don't generally increase their value on the international market. So I think UKIP ultimately might have some good ideas couched in all the crazy, but I think ultimately their reason for being a party is they just don't like foreigners. And I think that's a problem. But there are lots of more parties like that springing up in Europe because it's the easy rhetoric. You know, our state is failing because Europe is failing. We can't choose what to do because Europe tells us what to do. There were historic problems in Greece, but they were probably problems that meant we should have looked closely at whether Greece joined the Euro in the first place. Greece has always had a problem collecting taxes, for example. There's always been a deficit in the national coffers in that sense. My friends and I drove through Greece once. We drove from Belgrade to Athens. And we stopped in Thessaloniki for petrol. We pulled up at a petrol station. This was before the financial crisis ever kicked in. We pulled up at a petrol station. And we asked the guy to fill up the car. And we handed him a MasterCard. And he said, oh, sorry, sorry, no petrol. And we said, oh, we can pay cash. Oh, how much you want? An awful lot of Greece, historically, has never trusted their government. So they work in what we call a grey economy, cash in hand. They refuse to pay taxes and they would prefer to purchase their, their own access to services. That means that Greece was always going to be a problem when the economic crisis hit, whether it was the drachma or the euro. The way that Germany is denying Greek democracy, I think, is problematic. But I think it's separate from purely financial issues. I think there is also an element within Greece that is willing to deny Greek democracy. The Greek Premier just four days ago said that the reason they shut down the national broadcaster was not one of economics. He admitted it was because too many people on the left worked for that broadcaster. And when the people are admitting that this is all political rather than economic, it makes me start to doubt all the criticisms that are purely based on the economics of the European Union. As I've said before, the United States functions with much closer fiscal union, even though there's just as much disparity between states like Alabama and Arkansas and rich states like New York and California. If they can do it, there's no reason why we can't. Okay. Um, so one more thing. Uh, what do you think of total free movement of people when Finland and Romania are in the same I think it's fine. I think it's absolutely fine. I think we underestimate or overestimate sometimes why people move. In Britain we've got this terrible fear that the moment Poland joined we would be flooded by Poles. We would all have to start learning Polish in school because there would be so many Poles living in Britain. They did come initially and many people were very, very grateful. Because we now have plumbers who did a job on time and didn't expect to be paid thousands for botching it. We have builders who showed up at 8 o'clock in the morning and didn't spend four hours having a tea break. 
But what we see now is that migration is happening the other way. There are more Poles leaving Britain than are coming in. So we paint a picture of our own country as being the perfect place, being the paradise of the Union to which every other person is going to come and take our resources. It just doesn't happen. There are reasons other than economics for migration. And there are reasons other than economics for staying at home. People stay at home because they're comfortable. People go abroad for a couple of years and go back with new expertise. I genuinely think that the free movement of peoples has been far better than it has been a detriment to the European Union. I don't think any country can point to the free movement of peoples and say that's the problem with our immigration system. The vast majority of the immigration that we've tried to curb in the UK hasn't been European immigration. It's been immigration from outside the EU. So, you know, I don't think there's been a problem in Germany historically, and certainly not economically, with Turkish guest starbiter. There might have been a problem socially, with people finding it difficult to have an influx of migrant peoples with a different religion or different culture. But economically, guest starbiter in Germany have been an unqualified good. Generally speaking, and this is true of every economic analysis we've done of immigration, Immigration is a net economic benefit to the country receiving the immigrants. Very rarely, if ever, does it cost a country money to take people in. Because the people who come are usually the people who are determined, who work hard, and who end up contributing to the society. All the scare stories you hear about people coming to live on your welfare benefits simply don't exist. If they exist at all, they're an incredibly small percentage. We're talking a fraction of 1% of all welfare payments in the European Union going to migrants. And an even smaller percentage being due to fraud. We're not seeing huge floods of cash leave countries and go to countries outside the European Union in remission payments. We're not seeing massive fraud on a welfare level, but we're hearing that reported in the media all the time. The statistical analysis just doesn't bear out the scare stories that parties like UKIP put forward. And that's the problem with parties like UKIP, is their arguments are easy. Easy to make, easy to listen to, easy to believe. They don't stand up to any rigorous analysis. That's why, as a professional communicator in the UK, I've challenged UKIP to debate me on several different occasions. They've refused every single time. Why? Because they know they're going to lose when proper scrutiny is put on their policies. Oh, this is, this is obviously what's wrong with us. And then, if you want to do anything about it, they, they never come forward. Yeah. So, and if you're so anti-French, don't call yourself Nigel Farage. It's Farage. <laughs> you can't pronounce your name in a French way and then say you don't like the French. But genuinely speaking, genuinely, I think that a lot of the rhetoric they use is simplistic. It's what people like to think about migration. Immigration bad, because it changes the demographic of our country. It's just not been proved to be the case ever. And until they can show me the evidence, rather than just rhetoric, I'm free to disbelieve it. Okay? Any other questions? All right, preparation time it is, folks. Thank you very much. Do me a favor before you go. Things that I've quoted as um, data, evidence, Article 27, Article 28, check those. Because there have been subsequent treaties since I finished my law studies, I no longer practice European law, so I might be slightly out of date. Those article numbers change with every treaty we issue. Okay? Thanks very much.